1986, economist Herbert Stein laid out what has since become known as Stein's Law. If something cannot continue forever, it will stop. Pretty simple statement. What I want to do is to take Stein's Law and do a net assessment, not of individual progressive policy pursuits, but looking at all of them collectively, because I think that's where the big problem is. And that gets me to, you know, the title of this video is, Why Bother Going to College? 20 years before Herbert Stein, there was what, what I would call uh, the Gallagher maxim. Who was Gallagher? I'm not talking about the comedian. Gallagher was Father Gallagher, who taught me uh, history in high school as, I think, sophomore and senior years. Uh, he was I would say without a doubt, as somebody who's gone all the way through, his, you know, as a student, right through the graduate level in history, Father Gallagher was the worst history teacher I've ever had in my life. He didn't even lecture. What he used to do was read out of a textbook and he would stop, you know, wherever the end of a sentence when the bell rang mid paragraph and he'd put a little dot with his pencil. And the next day he'd come back and he'd erase the dot and pick it up and just keep reading. And the problem was I read about three times as fast as he read aloud. So it was an incredibly boring class and I hated it. But every now and then he would stop reading and give us some anecdotes of things that had happened to him or people he knew. And every now and then we'd get a really good one. And it was one that's always stuck with me. And this is since sophomore year in high school. So I was probably, uh, what was I, I don't know, 14, maybe 15 years old. And he told, call it the parable of the wagon. And he was talking about society and how society should operate ideally. And he said, you know, people, there were people had problems. And he looked at society as a wagon. And you had, he said, most of the people pull the wagon. They pull society along. But there are some people who are too infirm to pull, you know, people who are, are disabled, uh, people who are just too old, people who are mentally impaired. And he said in a, in a good society, a fair society, a just society, a Christian society, after all, this was a you know, private Catholic school, those people should be able to ride in the wagon. And the people pulling the wagon should not have a problem with the fact that they're pulling what other people are riding. But, Father, Father Gallagher pointed out, there was a caveat. And this was, you have to remember, this is 1964, 65-ish, and this is, you know, the Great Society and the War on Poverty and all these other things. And he warned that there was a tendency in American politics and American society to redefine who could ride in the wagon up to keep raising the limit where you could be under this bar so you could ride in the wagon. And he said the problem with that is as you do that, more people start riding in the wagon, which means the wagon gets heavier. And you have a heavier wagon pulled by ever fewer people. So the burdens on the people pulling the wagon continue to grow. And as the burdens grow, he said, more people can't pull, so they get to ride. And you get into this cycle where the wagon keeps getting heavier and heavier and heavier, and fewer people are pulling it, which means the individual burden of the people pulling gets heavier and heavier and heavier. And he said, at some point, inevitably, if you keep doing this, the wagon stops moving, or the people pulling the wagon say, enough. And they turn around and tell everybody to get out of the wagon. Now, that's Gallagher's law, Gallagher's uh, dictum, as opposed to uh, Stein's law. But Father Gallagher was saying this 20 years before Herbert Stein. But it's basically the essentially the same kind of uh, idea that if something, if a trend cannot continue, it won't. And that's what I want to continue to talk about here. The problem we have is the progressives come out with all these ideas. You know, we're going to have free health care. You get free education, you know, free this, free that, free housing. All these things are human rights. 
And what happens is the media examines these things as individuals, individual issues. And basically, conservatives tend to do the same thing. So if you're talking about health care, they'll come up with an argument against universal health care, but progressives push universal health care. But that's not really the problem. The problem is taking all these different policies together, where do you end up? That's where this issue or idea of net assessment comes in. And the Defense Department actually has an office of net assessment. What's net assessment? Well, it's looking at all these things together and not an individual thing. I remember, for example, going to the first Gulf War. I remember watching CNN one night and they had this military expert on there saying, you know, that, you know, we had poured billions of dollars in the military under Reagan and Bush. And, you know, God damn it, the Iraqis had better artillery than we had. I said, what? Well, the Iraqis had a 122 millimeter gun. That was their standard artillery gun. Ours was a 105 millimeter. Okay. Well, the 122 fired a bigger shell and it could fire further. Ergo, Iraqi artillery was superior to American artillery. Now, if you're a moron and you just look at gun versus gun, you could say, yeah, but that's not how things work in the military. Military, you have combined arms. So all these things have to work together. And that's where net assessment comes in. For example, the Iraqi gun was towed, which means as you pulled around a battlefield on a truck, set up, artillery has to be unloaded, it takes a long time before you can get your first shot off. And then once you're set up, you don't move very quickly. You can't move at all, really. And to shoot again, if you want to move, it involves all this time. Whereas the American 105 was, for the most part, except for the airborne units, uh, self-propelled. It's on a tank chassis, armored. They, you know, drop that rake in the back, back up over it, they're ready to shoot. And they can do what they call shoot and scoot, get off a couple rounds and move. Because as soon as you shoot, you, enemy artillery can, uh, radars can pick up the, the parabola of, of the incoming shell and figure out where it came from. And you do counter battery fire on that. So the Americans could avoid counter battery fire by getting off, you know, three, four, five, six rounds and quickly moving. Whereas the Iraqis, once they were set up and they started to shoot, they were going anywhere. So we would zero in on them and hit them with counter-battery fire. The other problem, of course, is the American artillery is designed to operate in an area where we control the air, or at least can test the air. So the Iraqis could fire further, but they couldn't see over the horizon because they had no air reconnaissance, which we did. So the fact that they could shoot an extra X number of miles than our 105s could shoot really didn't make a difference because they couldn't see what they were going to shoot at, whereas we could see come in, or a mobile self-propelled artillery, shoot a couple rounds off and move, shoot a couple rounds off and move. And the Iraqis just got chewed up. The Iraqis had horrible artillery, as events in the war showed. That's net assessment. And that's what I want to look at now and do with all these different things, not individual pieces, but the collectively, the pieces of progressive policy proposals that are laying around out there. What do progressives want to make free? Let's look at it all. Healthcare is a human right, Bernie Sanders tells us. So everybody gets free healthcare. Housing, look at LA, $700,000 market price units going to the homeless. That's more than twice the value of the home my wife and I live in. And that, you know, worked and paid for and pay the taxes and everything else. So we're giving people free housing. You got free healthcare. They want free education. Now, right now, it's, you know, community college or public. Eventually, you know what's going to happen. You're going to say, well, you know, only the rich white people get to go to Harvard and Yale. And so this is unfair. So we have to let people go to any college they can get into. So eventually, the government will pay for you to go to Harvard or Yale, too. So it's going to be free college education. You already got free secondary education, free elementary education, free K education, free preschool education. So all your education is going to be paid for. Uh, everybody should have internet. It's free internet. It's unfair that some people don't, can't afford internet. You know, you got Obama phones. Everybody's going to get a free smartphone. You know, you may have limited minutes and data, but you're going to get a free phone. Uh, you're going to get uh, food stamps. If you're below a certain poverty line, you'll get uh, food stamps added into the equation. And let's see, what else, what else are you going to get? Oh, oh, money you know, guaranteed income or minimal income or something. Every month you get a check from a government, depending on the size of your family and everything. And this check will come in and you have all this, all this cash. 
Now, if you look at all these things collectively, you know, and, and, and just say you're a, you're a, a, you've, you've grown up in a household where your mother and father are benefiting from all these programs, say 20, 25 years from now, why would you even bother to go to college? What's the point? I mean, what do you need? <laughs> you, you got free public transportation. They're paying for your housing. You've got, you don't have to worry about health insurance because you're getting free, free government health care. You get food stamps. So you got plenty to eat. You got a guaranteed check coming in every month. Why bother to take advantage of a free college education? What are you going to do when you get out of college? Work? For what? Housing? Health care? I mean, one of the things that got me working, I mean, yeah, I wanted to do what I, I loved doing what I did, and, you know, or at least I thought I would do, love doing what I did. It turned out I didn't. But you do those things to put food on the table. You know, I was always worried about, you know, did we have a house to live in? You know, we have health care in case somebody got sick? Did we have, you know, f food on the table? Roof on our heads? Transportation, internet for the, the kids that would do this or that and you know, play a traveling softball or traveling baseball or whatever, volleyball. These are the things you work for. But if they're all going to be given to you, why work? I mean, what's the advantage of working at that point? Now, I'm not saying nobody will work anymore, but there'll be a lot of people who won't. I mean, what are the advantages of going out and working? Well, you know, if you make a lot of money, you're, what, are you going to get 90% tax bracket hit? They're just going to take it all anyway. Who the hell is going to be paying for all this free stuff for everybody else when they're not working? I mean, think about that for a second. If you do not just one policy, all their policies collectively, and you put them in force, why bother? Why do we need free college education? How many people are likely to go to college? There'll, there'll always be some. There'll always be, I, I want to become a doctor and save lives, or I want to be a social worker and I want to help, or I want to be a mental health expert. I mean, there'll always, there always be people who will, will still do those things. I mean, there are people, you know, <laughs> I was taught by priests. They didn't get paid, but they did what they felt they needed to do in their heart or their soul or whatever. And there'll be people like that. But you know damn well that it, it, There'll be a lot of people, probably the majority of the people will just say, why bother? I've got my housing. I've got my health care. I've got my monthly stipend coming in. I mean, I had a friend. He went out on disability when he was about 20. He died when he was about 65. He lived for 45 years. He didn't work. You know, his house was paid for. The state covered his health. He was basically a Medicaid patient. He got a monthly check. Internet, food stamps, the whole bit. He lived for 45 years. He was fine. He was still crazy, but, but I mean, he lived well. Why bother? When I was in college, I took a course on religion. And the guy was a really nice guy, kind of hippy-dippy kind of guy. You know, he came in. I remember the first day, he gave us all index cards. And he said, uh, you know, he told us he didn't take role. And he, what he wanted us to do on the index card was to write what grade we wanted from the course and give us uh, a justification for it. I said, you know, this guy crazy. So I got my index card. I put my name on it, my student number, as instructed. And I wrote A, dash, and I wrote, I got to get my GPA up to 2.5 to get into the co this College of Education. And I was below 2.5 at that point. I really needed an A to help with that. And we all turned it in. There were about 30 students in the class that day. So I came back the next day, two days, two days later, and there were about five people there. And then I stopped coming. Eventually, every now and then I drop in. He was actually pretty interesting. And, and I had already bought the books and I didn't return them. And I eventually read them all. I think I only read one that semester. And I'd show up, and it'd be the same five or six people there. And one, one day after class, one of them asked me, why are you here? Because it turns out they were all religious studies majors, or planning to be. 
So they needed the information in the course, not just the grade. Whereas I was going to be a history major, I was just taking this course as a, you know, a side thing. So it didn't really matter to me. I just needed a grade. And I took it because it, in the little book they used to give us on feedback, this guy was like really easy. I got an A. I went a couple times. I eventually read all the books. They, they were all pretty good books. He was, he was pretty interesting the few times I was there. But other than, you know, me showing up occasionally and these religious studies students, pre-major pre students, nobody else came. And I'm sure they all got whatever grade they had asked for. That's basically, you know, we're, we're, we're heading toward an American society. You know, give us a card and tell us what you want a month. And we'll give it to you. And what's going to happen is majority of the people in that class majority of people in our society won't show up. They're not going to go out and work. They may not even go to college. What's the point? I mean, if you go to college in, in a progressive world, what are you going to get out of it? I mean, even in the Soviet Union, if you didn't work, you didn't eat, or you're going to live a really horrible existence, you know, jammed into a little one or two room apartment. That's eventually where we'll end up if we do this kind of thing. And it gets back to not just, you know, Stein's law. If something can't continue forever, it'll stop because it's going to stop. But also Gallagher's law. You know, you put everybody in the wagon and you got a handful of people pulling. At some point, they're not going to pull. Or at some point, even if they want to pull, they're not going to be strong enough to pull. And the wagon will stop. And that's where we're going to head if the progressives get their way in this country. The wagon will stop. What happens when the wagon stops? What happens when the people who need to be pulled, the people who truly need to be pulled, no longer are being pulled because there aren't enough of the people to do the pulling? And what happens when the people who are doing the pulling look back at the people in the car and say, get out? Especially in a country with uh, you know, 400 million guns. <laughs> I don't think it's a pretty picture. But that's where we're headed. That's where progressives want to lead us. And we have to look at it, not just these individual policies as individual policies. We have to look at them in this broad brush way. That's my take on all this. Let me know what yours is in a comment. If you like the video, give it a thumbs up. Subscribe to the channel if you can. Hit the notification button so you know when I post new videos. Share the video with your friends. And until next time, keep fighting.